Welcome to Stories of Windsor, a podcast celebrating the rich history of our community by the river. In this episode, we're exploring the buried secrets of our local cemeteries and introducing you to some of their long forgotten residents. Welcome back, ladies. So here we are for our second episode of Stories of Windsor. So excited to have us back together again. So this time we are going to be talking about local cemeteries and their buried secrets, which is somewhat appropriate for this time of year. For those that are new to the podcast, if we can go ahead and just reintroduce ourselves and just what cemeteries you're going to be discussing today. Hi, I'm Mary Lou Gillison. I am a local history and genealogy library located at the local history branch in Sandwich Town, and I will be discussing the St. John's Anglican Church and its cemeteries. Uh, I'm Carla Morano, and I'm a library service representative at WPL, and today I'm talking about two interesting and very historic uh, cemeteries. Christ Church Cemetery and the Wyandotte Indian Cemetery, both in Amherstburg. And I'm Erica McKenzie. I'm a public service librarian for the Windsor Public Library, and I will be starting us off with the Windsor Grove Cemetery. The reason I'm starting with Windsor Grove Cemetery is we actually did a little training tour during a staff training not too long ago where we participated in the McDougal Corridor walking tour. Uh, information around black history in the area, fascinating tour that takes you through the McDougal Corridor, but it ended in the Windsor Grove Cemetery. And what struck me was the condition of the cemetery. And I was a little taken aback by that. There's some gravestones that are overturned. Whether they are by hand or by nature it can be up for debate because it looks like some are just overturned from time and decades. And, and the other thing that got me was I drove in there and like the road access, you're, you're literally driving over people's graves at one point, which... I know it's hard to not do, but it's it made me feel a little bit icky. To give a little background, I studied British history in university, and I did a, a paper on Victorian death practices. When I was doing the research for that paper, there was two very distinct practices that emerged. There was honoring and offering tribute to the person in their death versus the long-term care and maintenance of the dead. Windsor Grove is one of the oldest cemeteries in Windsor dating back to 1866. It is actually the final resting place of Samuel Smith McDonnell, which was Windsor's first mayor, as well as veterans from the First and Second World Wars. There is also a memorial to local firefighters who have passed, and that is maintained separately by the Professional Firefighters Association. In saying that, local residents and family members have repeatedly expressed concern about the deteriorating condition of the cemetery, citing its overall shabby look. But since the cemetery is legitimately bulging at the seams. It's filled to capacity and there's no new money coming in. The current trustees and general manager are looking to volunteer agencies to help with the overall maintenance. The Ontario Genealogical yeah. Society yes. is one of those groups who are trying to keep the maintenance of Windsor Grove. We're recently awarded a prize for their contribution to local history. Once I dove into the Windsor Grove Cemetery's history, it was a little bit evident that these concerns are not new to our current period. Notices regarding the outcomes of property disputes associated with the Windsor Grove Cemetery are mentioned in Windsor papers starting as early as 1898. There's been a long debate of ownership around Windsor Grove Cemetery and their council has in the past been accused of not always aligning its values and intentions with the city or private holders. One particular article that popped out was on April 9th of 1930 from the Border City Star. An article highlighted the request of a local charity committee to the East Windsor Council asking that the Windsor Grove Cemetery offer cheaper plot prices for the graves of paupers. The charity had received a bill of $212.25 from the Janison Funeral Home for, quote, undertaking expenses of an indigent. The council suggested that the charity get prices from Greenlawn Cemetery as they would charge less than half than Windsor Grove. It went further explained that even one of the council's aldermen commented that Windsor Grove Cemetery charged him $98 for digging up some vaults that had been misplaced by their own mistake. Fast forward to 1958, 
And this is when sort of a, a big land dispute came into fruition was between residents and Windsor Grove Cemetery when up for debate was 28 acres of land was on the table to be used as new parkland. And the authorities of the Windsor Grove Cemetery wanted to buy the land for its expansion, but sell back 12 to the city. So essentially they were gonna buy 28 acres from the city and sell them back 12. The mayor at the time, Michael J. Patrick, there was a tie vote, he broke the tie on the issue, and all 28 acres ended up going to the addition of a Prince Road Park, which is now part of Micmac Park. Mary, you and I were talking earlier about, could that have been because of a water issue? Well, that and the town does have, for example, if you look at the St. John's Anglican Cemetery, the tombstones that have sunk into the ground are because of the water table issue. That's a big part of it, as well as time, history, care. There is definitely a geological reason behind it, because if you look at certain areas from the river, just by looking at it now, it's kind of wavy. Like it has, Windsor is notoriously flat, but it has like these little... And that's what part of Windsor Grove looks looks like. It's like like there's a wave in there. So I'm like, that seems more natural than someone tipping over a tombstone. And that's exactly where people like OGS that I'd mentioned, they know how to find these things. If you look along the riverfront where Windsor Grove is as well, that is a very moist clay filled area. So like I would imagine between the geographic, like the clay and everything, plus you're adding new burial sites Mm -hmm. each time, that's just going to cause a lot of disturbance and shifting. So I don't think the maintenance people are not necessarily 100% to blame (laughs) if there was any blame to be placed. But it looks like this now. What's it going to look like in another 200 years? And and how do we protect the people that are in that cemetery, especially given that there's some very notable people there? But despite all of this, Windsor Grove Cemetery was once considered a very angelic and tranquil place for people to visit, not just to to pay respects to deceased loved ones, but people used to stroll through there, have little picnics. In August 17th, 1939 editorial, Thomas R. Brophy wrote of Windsor Grove, and I love this, this is very 1930s language. I remember what was considered a great pastime of a Sunday afternoon to go out to Windsor Grove Cemetery picking violets and myrtles. Many a beautiful romance blossomed among the tombstones at Windsor Grove Cemetery in those days. And Windsor Grove actually also held annual ceremonies to remember those who died throughout the Great War, especially in World War I. And during the height of the Second uh, World War, those ceremonies also recognized those who had died in the war during the previous years. It wasn't immune to its antics, both seemingly innocent and destructive. In the spring of 1939, The trustees of Windsor Grove Cemetery put a notice in the paper offering a $50 reward for information leading to the party or parties responsible for the destruction of 15 monuments. The funniest one, though, that I found, and this is very appropriate for this time of year as we're coming into Halloween, was an article from 10 years later in September of 1949. And I will read the article title because it makes me laugh. Graveyard ghoul to prowl no more. Windsor Frankenstein fined $15 for his antics. <laughs> <laughs> so, and there's, uh, I have the, the copy of the article in front of me, and there is a quite hilarious picture of, of a man wearing a full suit and tie and a Frankenstein mask, and the police officer standing next to him just half smirking, half looking completely exasperated. But the individual wanted to his face to remain anonymous, but his name was Donald. He was fined $15 for frightening a group of women who were walking through the Windsor Grove Cemetery one night. <laughs> and as they described it, suddenly from the shadows of the graveyard came a hulking figure. Dim lights played on the ghastly countenance of the Frankenstein monster. <laughs> From gaping mouth came the groans of a soul in mortal anguish. <laughs> wow. Yes. Wow. Just Mary ter- Shelley couldn't have written it better. No. And then it goes on. Eight heels beat a resounding tattoo on the pavement as their owners fled. So I'm guessing eight heels means it was four women <laughs> running from this Frankenstein monster. <laughs> I think we each touched on some residents of each of our cemeteries of not necessarily famous people, but the stories that sort of stuck out for us. One is actually very heart- sad but heartwarming. And the other one is is a bit of a, a juicy murder. So Windsor Grove Cemetery was once considered Windsor's version of Potter's Field. And for those who may not be familiar with the term, Potter's Field refers to a pauper's or common grave reserved for those who are unknown, unclaimed, or indigent. In this case, there was a gentleman named Mr. Hubert Haynes 
who passed away in May of 1929. And he was a veteran of two British wars, but he died friendless and alone, and it was due to be buried in a pauper's grave in Windsor Grove Cemetery. However, his military comrades found out that he had died and spoke up against this and shared his story of service with both the mayor of Windsor and the military officials in Windsor. And instead, he was buried with full military honors. There's a line in the last part of his obituary that states, the city was saved the shame of burying a veteran of two British wars in a potter's field. I wasn't able to find Hubert's name in the database for Windsor Grove Cemetery or find a grave, Mm -hmm. but that I feel could be just his headstone or if it was just like a flat stone may have just fallen to the elements and not have been uncovered yet or is just not readable because of time because this was in 1929 so we're going Mm. almost 100 years here so and so the one I'm going to end with Windsor Public Library has been working on a murder file which sounds just as interesting as it is it's not in human resources no (laughs) (laughs) it's a research tool it's a research tool so essentially staff have been working together collating articles from the local paper by decade of documentation of of murders that have happened in Windsor. I want to say I spent six hours in there one day because there's some good stuff in there. There's some very interesting stories and, and this was definitely one that popped up. His name is William D. Allen and in May 1949, William, who was aged 37 at the time, arrived home with his wife just after midnight. After his wife went to bed, William sat down at his kitchen table to enjoy a cup of coffee and complete a crossword puzzle when he was shot in the back of the head with a shotgun through his kitchen window. Investigators found no plausible motives for his murder. He was an employee of the Ford Motor Company and described as a good worker and basically an all-around good guy. They couldn't find any reason why he would be the target of this attack. But this is where the story goes deeper. So 13 months prior to Allen's murder, there was an assassination attempt on Walter P. Rothier, the UAW president at the time. Initially, the police ruled out any link between the two crimes. That is until four days later, after Allen's murder, there was another assassination attempt set up similarly to the way Allen was killed on Walter's brother, Victor, who was then also serving as the educational director of the UAW. So my thought was maybe there was a mistaken identity because they're pretty close together. Also, Victor and William Allen were exactly the same age. They were both 37 when Victor had his assassination attempt. Same thing, shotgun through the window and they missed, they got him in the arm. But Victor lived in Detroit, so did Walter, and Alan lived on Huron Line in Windsor. Both Victor and his brother Walter were very well known in the States. Victor was very big in like labor management and and part of labor unions. And his brother Walter was a civil rights activist and Eleanor Roosevelt commented on their assassination attempts because they were that higher up in, in the American government. And William Allen, everything was essentially the same between all three shootings, but William was the only one that died. And to this day, the murder remains unsolved, and nor have the Walter Victor shooters ever been found. And this was 1949 you can search the database and and you can find out where William is buried in Windsor Grove Cemetery. Cemeteries are very interesting because they don't just reflect the people who died there. They reflect how the community treated those people. And I think particular cemetery I'm dealing with was St. John's Anglican is very interesting because the development of the cemetery actually was around the development of Sandwich Town, which I find very interesting. You can't have one without the other. When I was looking into this, I thought, there's no way I can talk about this without talking about a lot of the famous historical things that happened. To understand history, just don't think of death as something of the past. But if you visit the dead, when you see the, the tombstones and the burials, you see the script and the way they write things. It's, yeah, it's, that's the big thing for me. I studied Tudor history and I got, which is almost unheard of, 10 minutes alone with Elizabeth I's tomb in Westminster Abbey. Because I got there super early. I went right to her her space because usually you're herded through there like cattle because it's so busy because everyone was in the other part of like following the actual tour and I just beeline and there's something about being in that space knowing she's right there and I had the same feeling when I went to see Churchill's grave I'm like this this is history and they're right 
there. There's just, there's some sort of, I don't know if intimacy is the right word, but it sort of brings things full circle. Somebody you wouldn't have access to necessarily in life, you can actually go pay your respects to one-on-one in debt. Well, that's yeah. an interesting perspective. I, yeah. like, I like that. You basically said everything that about that, so thank you, because I don't think I would have summarized it as nicely. <laughs> One of the things that I found when I was doing this search, and that's why I preempted it by saying the history of the area, is that there were so many listings of graveyard, cemetery, burial lot, potter's grave. They're not identical terms, but they're very close. So if I can put it in perspective, you have a townhouse, you have a mansion, you have a duplex, you have a bungalow. That's the only way I can really explain the semantics behind these words. And I think it's very important when you're looking at historical documents, things that were written, to really examine what those people meant, the person who wrote it. What were they inferring? What knowledge did they have? And I think when you see the development of St. John's Anglican Church, it is a complete reflection of the development of what we call Salish Town. So uh, getting back to that, the earliest tombstone they have is from 1793. And her name was uh, Hembrow, but you can't find really anything about her, but her name was Margaret Hembrow. And they actually did not have an Anglican church officially until 1802, so 1802. What's interesting is there were two missionaries that came through. So we know about people, people talk about the Jesuits and Assumption Church and Assumption Cemetery. This was somewhat of the Anglican version, but they had two pastors or reverends that had come down went through the making sure that the moral lives of the people who were here were okay, doing the conversion route. But one of them had asked, please, can we have some money to build a church? Well, in 1796, when the government had to send all of their offices from Detroit and move them over to Sandwich Town, that's when they started taking this seriously. And that is when Peter Russell, who is known for the Russell Papers, he's a huge part of Canadian history, was a big part of the government in the late 18th and early 19th century. He advocated for a church for probably six to eight months constantly, asking what they call the Bishop of Quebec, that's what they call the head of the church under the Anglican umbrella, or they did at the time. And finally, the Bishop conceded and said, okay, fine, we're going to give you 200 pounds because we do have this $2,000 grant to build churches. There's lots of people moving there. If you read it, you can hear the huff in his voice like... (sighs) Fine, we'll give you your $200, okay? <laughs> the people in, in Michigan in 1796, the Loyalists, they came to our area. So you went from like a French-Canadian population, which Assumption served, to a more English-speaking and Scottish population, which they did not have a structured settlement or religious settlement. So eventually, and we were talking about Bablo last time, the government said, you guys figure out what you want to do with this place in three years, or we're sending all the offices to Bois Blanc or Bablo Island. So you either get your stuff together or we're out of here. So when I talk about the church being part of the creation of the cemetery and the areas around it, they go hand in hand, just like politics. There was not a religious person or a reverend or a deacon. A lot of times local government officials, because they were considered representatives of the monarchy, and the monarchy was held in very high esteem, almost almost to like a religious belief. So you had people who were judged or sheriffs, people who were uh, local lawyers, and they would do readings on Sundays for people to come in and sit. And they know that they had a small log building that was built for this purpose of being a civic center, a place for the sheriff to work, sometimes used government purposes. And that would have been where the local jail that was shut down it would have been in that kind of vicinity. Now, please remember, we're not looking at straight roads. When I'm using language like Russell and Brock, because I, I have to mention these streets, we're looking at pathways. We're not looking at wide concrete streets. We're talking about something if a car- carriage could go down there, that was awesome. So eventually, this gentleman, Pollard, He so desperately wanted to have that church established that because he was a person of good reputation and he was good to the community, he went up to Quebec, he got ordained and came back and he ran out of this small building 
church services. And they even have like budgets of people like rental agreements because people actually had to rent a pew. And this is where once again, you get into the politics of the time, the development of the cemetery, the development of the church, because the people who rented the pews or paid fees well, you've got the Babies, you've got the Princes, you've got you know, the McKees. They're obviously, they're essential to Windsor and Essex history. And when you're looking at their income, because they have income receipts, and you just see rented and it's three pews, those people, if they didn't show up for church that Sunday, nobody else sat there. That was their reserve seating. So when you uh, look at what happened, was sandwiched in 1796 and like it became kind of known as like a rendezvous point for the loyalists and for people who are coming over and that's how Pollard was easily able to negotiate with the Bishop of Quebec but you know said look there's nobody down here and there's people they want this so basically he went up there he got ordained because there was a need for Anglican priests and and reverends and deacons and the interesting thing is is that where Miss Hembro, the 1793 grave is, it was basically in the area of what was a potter's field. And so it was a part of the east part of the acreage because when the church established it, they got two acres of land. So just think of that going down to the river all the way up to Peter Street over past Mill and towards Brock Street. So just think of that entire encompassing area as being to the church, church land. They did not have a specific consecrated land until they built the church in 1802, which was the creation of their diocese. But in 1802, this is how quickly this happened. The first baptism was the baptism of a child from May 24th, 1802. It was also the first burial under the Anglican Church through Pollard because the child died the next day. So when you talk about history and you talk about these things, the cemetery had to be consecrated. This land had to be consecrated. It had to be on holy ground. So they had to have an established church there. It goes from being a burial ground to, to a, a cemetery. cemetery. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of interesting things about the church, but when you look at the paperwork, I mean, there are references for renting pews, costs for weddings. I found really interesting was when you were looking at all these documents, you had something called a ban, which was announcing an intention to marry. And legally, if they did it three times prior to what they considered would be the day of marriage, it was considered a legal marriage. And there's a significant number of Anglican and Catholic people, and it lists that there are bans for the Catholic, and it will say, but this person was from the Assumption Parish. So you know that this was an interreligious couple, which in the ch Catholic Church was not allowed. And many times, if you check further, the person that was in the Catholic Church, who never converted, let's say, is married next to his wife or her husband at St. John's Cemetery. And what's also fascinating about the cemetery is how it reflects on the perspectives and the goals of the church itself. When you go to Assumption, there was a section for Indigenous people, a section for Blacks, and a section for European-based or white people. And they were all separate. There is no distinction or special area for that particular reason. And even the gravestones will list people that were honored through a cemetery. But when I was doing this research, I was like, yeah, but this person was supposed to be, this burial ground was over here, but how could it be over here and over here at the time? Well, it turns out that burial grounds were basically for prisoners and a potter's field. If you look at kind of the hill that faces maybe in between uh, Brock, maybe going a little bit further west past Mill, if you look up, they actually executed people there. They put them in gibbets, which were irons that it was like a big iron cage and they would let you starve to death and your body would rot 
away, pieces would fall to the earth, as did the iron gibbets. And when there was some construction being done many, many years ago, they found bones and pieces of iron. And if you go back to some of the church papers or some of the comments or letters, they're complaining about, oh my God, this smell in the summer, it's awful. How can you do this? You know, we have to go past this. People could be going down the Detroit River and within a waveable distance, see people just hanging there dying. The last technical execution in Windsor, meaning through the government, not through the military, was in 1943. And it was two young men from Detroit who they said murdered somebody, even though just before the execution, there's a whole article in the Windsor Star about it and what they did, what did they eat, who brought what. Like, I mean, it's huge. And you know that those people will not be interred at St. John's Anglican. They will be put in a potter's field. It says here in 1889, the property on which the bodies of these two men were buried, this person named Calvin Cook was building something there and he came across a gravel pit and that's where they found this huge pile of bones and iron pieces. And it wasn't like there was one or two. I mean, it was just a big mass grave of bones. And we don't think of those things here. No. But that's because when you're reading the documents, a burial ground is not a sacred ground. A burial ground is a place that you put people that need to be put to earth. And that's it. Some of the iron, uh, the gibbet irons were passed on. He actually wanted to keep the iron. That's what they were done. Like he was a very frustrating man. He wanted to keep the iron for himself. Like, that's wow. medieval stuff right that's there. That's exactly the word I was thinking. Medieval. There's this one here. Angus McDonald, a pastor of Assumption Church, he actually, a man who was convicted of a specific crime and suffered to the gibbet, he confessed to this priest after, on his deathbed, and then the priest came forward and spoke to the people, um, to the sheriff and said, you know, this person should be buried in consecrated ground because this Fitzgibbons guy was blamed for this crime, was executed for it. And so they wanted to make sure that if they could find his bones, he should have a right to a, an honorable uh, burial. But I mean, you had um, a man, 1840, there was a man named Huffman hanged for murdering his daughter's illegitimate child in Kent County. He had a beautiful daughter by whom he had a child. His child was found drowned in the Thames River. People from Chatham out to Colchester, all over Kent and Essex County, they came here for that. They sent them here, and they sent them across from St. John's Anglican Church. And that was the easiest place to take care of these yeah. troublesome people. At one point, the church owned like acre where the current Windsor Jail is, and it wasn't considered a cemetery, so they just redug it up, filled it over, and they were like, okay, that's our property now. Like it was deeded to them because it wasn't consecrated land. They just said, no, it's, you know, we need to have our municipal offices here. We need to have a jail. We need to have this. You know what? There's nothing important here anyways, even though it was really part of the potter's field. The War of 1812, that church burned to the ground by William Henry Harrison's Kentucky troop, who ended up becoming the president of the United States, although for only one month. Yeah. And that's the quote unquote curse for burning down a church. That's an old story. But what he did is he took over uh, what we now call the Duff Babby House. He hung out there. That's where, you know, having a good time. And then he stabled his horses and the troops' horses in the church. And then before he burned the church down in 1813. He stole all the like all the holy books, like the church Bibles and stuff that he had with them. They ran off and took the books from the church before they burned it all down, where there was a small cabin or, or building across from where the church is now. They eventually made that into the 40, fortified brick barracks in 1814. And now there is where I get to work at Brock School uh, or that location is originally one of the barrack sites, but all of that was owned by the church. But there are definitely burials that are during that timeline. And the ones that happened during the War of 1812 may have been buried later, but it says this person died at the War of 1812.
And it, it suffered a similar fate, what they used to call a Patriot War, 1837 to 1838. Then there's pictures of people sitting and cheering, and they're all just looking all manly and strong. And you know that they're going to end up desecrating these properties. And they did. These guys kicked over tombstones, smashed things. There was no respect for this. And meanwhile, you have people hanging in gibbets uh, 20 feet away from you. And the interesting thing, too, is they didn't even have a rectory or an altar built when it was approved to be open again for the people. And that was what they call the Mother Church. That was the first established Anglican church and cemetery in the area. And then they had this beautiful Christ Church being built at the same time. And yes, the McKee family, the Bagdasarians, the princes, the Banwells, the Askins, all have major monuments or tombs. People were buried underneath the church grounds. And even Reverend Pollard, who started the church, really, essentially, he has been reburied four times. In 1847, they added some stuff. And then in 1943, they added some stuff. Even in 1906, where right now there's something called Westgate Apartments or Residences, they built a rectory and a chapel there because it was so in demand. This church was getting so big that they had to keep on expanding it or they did that they would have to bury up these people who spent like huge funding for this church. And that comes back to the Victorian when cemeteries really took off in Victorian times, yes. right? Because they were running out of space in churches to bury people. Yeah. And the cremation and like non-sacred ground cemeteries became the new rage because where are we putting everybody? We're literally stacking them five deep in some mm-hmm. churchyards throughout England and parts of Europe. So things had to be done. So it makes sense that there was all these demands for churches because you wanted to be buried in sacred ground. But at mm-hmm. some point, the bubble burst oh, and we have Windsor Grove Cemetery opening in 1868 mm-hmm. when the modern day cemetery was born. Interestingly enough, another part of the cemetery history is during the Spanish flu, they actually buried people who had the Spanish flu in one section because they were afraid that the corpses would infect you because they would bury them all in one spot. Now, I'm ending this with the development of Christ Church, which was an expansion from the same family that helped with the development of St. John's. So I'm going to lend that topic over to you. All right. So when preparing for this conversation, I decided to interpret the phrase in our title, Buried Stories, as stories that most people probably aren't aware of, not necessarily something spooky or disturbing, just something more or less unknown. So my hope is to shed some light on a couple of um, very old cemeteries and some of the people who are buried there. And as Mary Lou just said, the first I'm going to talk about is a Christ Church Cemetery located in Amherstburg on the grounds of Christ Church. This cemetery is one of the oldest in Essex County. We have a great book at WPL called Christ Church Anglican by Terence Hall. And in this book, uh, the author notes that the cemetery is actually significantly older than the church. The church was built in 1818, opened in 1819, but the graves at the cemetery date from 1797. The cemetery originally served as a military burial site for the soldiers stationed at Fort Malden in Amherstburg. Most of these soldiers were of British origin, and so they practiced the Anglican faith. Mary Lou, you mentioned the date 1802 for the first St. John's Church. A congregation was established in Amherstburg at the exact same time, but no church. So church services were held right on the fort grounds in a little log cabin before Christ Church was actually built. But the soldiers and all other town people were buried in a large non-denominational burial ground, using that term again, on the west side of what is now Bathurst Street, which had been there since the 1790s. Okay, so it's a very old burial ground. There's another great resource we have available at WPL called Amherstburg 1796 to 1996, a town on garrison grounds. And there's a chapter in there that discusses all the town's burial grounds. The author notes that when the church was built in 1818, a piece of the graveyard was given over to the Anglican congregation. 
At the time, they called it the English Graveyard. So they didn't even call it cemetery yet. It was called the English Graveyard, and that's what it was referred to as on maps. According to local folklore, the soldiers were buried at the north end of the graveyard, which now overlooks Gore Street. In the 1880s, the church built a parish hall and later a rectory on this particular section of the property. And so I wonder if the soldiers who were buried there were ever exhumed or moved. Perhaps they're still there, and frankly, that creeps me out. Today, many of the gravestones are no longer there, and many others have fallen or have been remounted against the brick wall at the back of the cemetery. But burial records, which we also have available at our local history branch, show that several hundred bodies are buried in that cemetery with most of the graves currently unmarked. So again, talking about Windsor Grove, talking about St. John Cemetery, a lot of these gravestones did not survive, and so who knows? The uh, transcriptions from the Essex County branch of the Ontario Genealogical Society, they actually did a whole project where they transcribed and located every row. You can see it'll say broken, not visible but they know just by how the ground has sunk that there's something there. The undertaking of that is, ma like, it's just one little bit. I mean, think globally. Was that a pun? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like yes, it. Yes, it was. <laughs> Back to the cemetery. <laughs> so there are a few quote-unquote famous local people who are buried at the Christchurch Cemetery, including Alexander Duff who is the oldest, who has the oldest existing headstone in the graveyard. Duff is well known in the Windsor area because he was a prominent fur trader and he built the large mansion in Sandwich on Russell Street that Mary Lou mentioned earlier that we now call the Duff Bobby House. Mm. It is right along the water's edge to accommodate traders who would come ashore and stroll right into his front entrance to do business. Duff gave up the fur trading business and became a justice of the peace and captain of volunteers at Fort Malden, and he sold the house to Jacques Bobby in 1807. Duff passed two years later, so his gravestone dates to 1809. Another noteworthy person buried in the Christchurch Cemetery is John Ogilvy. Now, I'm mentioning John Ogilvy because he connects to our last episode on Boblo Island. Ogilvy was an experienced fur trader as well, primarily along the St. Lawrence River, but also down here along the Detroit River. In 1816, the British government called upon Ogilvy because of his knowledge of the uh, geography down here and appointed him as a boundary commissioner. If you recall from the Boblo episode, the boundary commission had to be called in to help determine what lands the British would keep and what lands the Americans would keep after the War of 1812. This was Ogilvy, mm -hmm. so he is directly involved with this decision to keep Boblo as Canadian territory. He perished a couple years later, and his gravestone dates to 1819. The other cemetery I wanted to bring up is one that I drive by often, and I've always wondered about it. I don't think a lot of people notice it, to be honest, because it's quite small and unassuming. And it is the Wyandotte Indian Cemetery, located in Amherstburg along the Detroit River. The address for it is 968 Front Road North. It is right along the river's edge. So I decided to dig, pun, <laughs> into this story <laughs> to find out more about this burial ground. And I discovered that it was part of a much larger Wyandotte Reserve dating all the way back to the late 18th century. In 1790, as part of the McKee Treaty, the Wyandotte, or Hurons as they were also called, were granted reservation lands in two areas. The Huron Church Reserve, which is in present-day Windsor, and the Wyandotte Reserve in what was then known as Anderton Township. This land is now within the borders of the town of Amherstburg. The reservation fell between the Detroit River and River Canard, taking advantage of all this fresh water and all this fertile land. Before the Wyandotte people in this area converted to Catholicism, they buried their dead according to their own traditional customs. And so, unfortunately, we have no idea where mm -hmm. some of the earlier Wyandots would have been buried. But once they converted to Catholicism, they began to practice the burial methods of Christians, which meant in distinct cemeteries, okay, mm -hmm. this consecrated ground. In or around 1836, the Wyandots living in this uh, reservation set up a Catholic cemetery on the edge of the Detroit River, and it still exists today, 
But the gravestones are in terrible condition. We've talked about this as well. Yep, they are weathered. They're Mm. hardly legible. They're falling over. And frankly, I even wonder if any of them have fallen into the river because the cemetery is that close close to the water. And I wonder if if there's ever been any erosion to the shoreline there that would have sent land into the water. The book I mentioned earlier about Amherstburg notes that the Wyandotte also set up a school for children on the reservation. And next to it, on an 1836 map, is the Indian School Burial Ground, as it was called. So this terminology, Indian School Burial Ground, leads me to believe that perhaps this burial ground was not Christian. This was perhaps of Wyandotte mm, tradition. That's okay? a good point. This uh, Indian School Burial Ground, at the time of the writing of this book, there were only two headstones remaining in that cemetery. This burial ground is not on the same property as the Wyandotte Indian Cemetery. It's east of the Detroit River, kind of further into the farmland. The author notes that the Indian School Burying Ground and the Wyandotte Cemetery are still unceded indigenous land and the last remnants of the former Wyandotte Reservation. Now, I I don't know exactly where the Indian School Burial Ground is. The map shows it, as I said, uh, on a property east of the Detroit River down Middleside Road, what is now Middleside Road. There's a lot of new housing development in this area, and I'm not sure if the gravestones are still there or if anyone has access to this property, Mm -hmm. but the Wyandotte Indian Cemetery is definitely accessible to the public and is directly next door to a public park. I'll talk a little bit about a couple people who are buried here. Uh, just to say their names again, because I'm sure their names have not been said for some time now. The first documented burial at the Wyandotte Indian Cemetery is of Margaret Dayantet, age 90. That is quite an age, considering she was buried there in 1858. Oh, go Pardon Margaret. me, 1856. The largest gravestone in the cemetery dates to 1885, and it belongs, unsurprisingly, to the last chief of this band of Wyandotte, Joseph White. Margaret Dayantet, the the woman I just mentioned, was his mother. And Joseph, uh, Chief Joseph White, was the father of a former Windsor mayor, Solomon White. According to an article in the Emsburg Echo in 1875, control of the Wyandotte Cemetery was granted to a group of trustees, which included White's sons, Solomon and Thomas. And it seems by the late 1800s, the Wyandotte people living on this reservation had become more and more assimilated into both Anglo and French Canadian cultures that dominated that area. So in the end, they decided to exchange their reserve lands for Canadian citizenship, except for the cemetery, which is still indigenous territory. I decided to look up the Wyandotte Cemetery in our Windsor Star database to see if there was anything interesting news-wise about the site over the years. And apparently uh, in the 80s, there was quite a lot of interest in the cemetery and the land right next to it. One article even said that the area had become an eyesore and that residents proposed that the town make the lands next to the cemetery a memorial park. Eventually that did happen and um, now the cemetery is attached to Angstrom Park. So that's the current status of the Wyandotte Indian Cemetery. So basically it's a public park next to a a burial. Yes, it's a very tiny park. There's like one picnic table and no parking. Nobody ever goes to it except sometimes you see a kid with a fishing pole in the (laughs) water there. That's about it. Were there any particular books that you found were helpful? I took a deep dive into uh, our newspaper database for Windsor Star. Yeah. I mean, it dates back to the late 1800s. So I spent hours in it. Um, I used some older documents. I actually used a, a book from 1909 called The Township of Sandwich Past and Present by Frederick Neal, who is buried in there. But I also used a, a book called St. John's Church Sandwich, Windsor, Ontario, for 1802 to 1952. Thinking about some of the things we've talked about, Erica, you mentioned earlier folks were using Windsor Grove almost like a park. Yeah. Okay. And it's full. There's no new money coming in. Same with the Wyandotte Cemetery. It's full. And in fact, there are no more Wyandotte people living in that area. So who is going to take care of it? And it made me think about 
maybe at some point should we consider turning over cemeteries into parkland? Mm. Does it become parkland at some point where there will be continuous continuous funding provided yeah. through tax dollars, right? So let them have a sacred space, let them have an honored space, but let that space give back to, or let the earth give back to what has given them. And I think that's a, a very, very interesting philosophy, especially if you look at um, a lot of the indigenous beliefs. Well, I'm saying that I don't know exactly where this saying comes from, but it's a Navajo saying, mm-hmm. and it basically goes, a person lives as long as the last person who remembers them. And I think at least having a name to look at is very important to be able to honor that. So if the the body, the great whatever is not there, the fact that the maintaining a name mm-hmm. isn't always happening, I think is what bothers me when it comes to perpetual care and like maintaining the actual grave site. Is sure, gonna, if there's some sort of plaque or some sort of notif- notification that says this is where this person and their name is buried and why I think it was important for all of us to say the names of those that we were talking about so their memory does live on in in some respect. This has been very informative and very interesting, and I hope everyone out there finds it just as fascinating as us three history geeks do. (laughs) But thank you so much, ladies. It's been another joyful time with you together. Stay tuned for our next episode when we will ring in the holiday season by exploring the retail experience of Windsor's past and how the opening of Devonshire Mall changed the way Windsorites shopped. Thank you for listening. This has been a Windsor Public Library Digital Branch production.